Minnesota Senate Elections, Minnesota Senate Elections Committee can uh, be called to order. We do not have a quorum yet, but we will soon have one. Uh, we are arranging, we have uh, four bills today, I'm sorry, three, three bills today, and uh, we're going to change the arrangement just a bit to have Senator Hoffman up first. Senator Hoffman has to, uh, has to go to another sure. committee, so we're going to handle him first. And, we do have a quorum. and now we have a quorum. So Senator Hoffman, uh, your bill number, Senate file 2144, and we do have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, thank you for hearing Senate file 2144, grants appropriations to improve access to polling places currently in state statutes. We have rules regarding what accessibility needs to be for our polling place. However, um, the, the, not every city and county has the resources to make it happen. While there are funds from the Help America Vote Act that can and have ex accessed, um, they have not met the needs of our state, Mr. Chair. Senate file 2144 appropriates a half a million dollars to a grant program to further assist our cities and counties in meeting the accessibility requirements of the law. Title I, Title II, Title III, you might as well go on the way the titles of the ADA that it should be, plus it also meets anything of the 504 of the Rehabilitation Act from 1973, but I won't go into detail on that one, but if you want to, I can. But voting is a fundamental right, and our role of governance is our duty uh, to ensure that the right is accessible to all Minnesotans. And so Trevor Turner is here, uh, Mr. Chair and members from uh, Miss, Miss Minnesota Disability, or the Minnesota, whatever, Co State Council on Disabilities. Uh, and then also we have the Assistant Secretary of State to give you some data on why it's needed. So with that, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. And I do want to make a no special note that uh, this does have a Republican on this bill, so it becomes a bipartisan bill, and I appreciate that. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll go to your testifier, which is uh, Mr. Trevor Turner. And please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Carlson and the members of the committee. My name is Trevor Turner. My name is Trevor Turner, and I am uh, the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, the Minnesota Council on Disability supports Senate File 2144 and urges members of this committee to do the same. As we all know, the right to vote is one of the most fundamental rights we have as Americans. It's how we express our opinions, values, beliefs, and how we participate in shaping the future of our communities, our state, and our country. However, for many people with disabilities, exercising that right can be difficult, if not impossible, due to a wide range of barriers that they face. Some of those barriers are physical in nature. For example, many polling places have narrow doorways, steep staircases, or other physical obstacles that can make it difficult or impossible for people with mobility disabilities to enter or navigate the space. This can be especially challenging for people who use wheelchairs or other mobility aids and may not be able to access the voting booths or other essential features of the polling place. Other barriers are communication related. For example, people with hearing or speech disabilities may have difficulty understanding the voting process or communicating their choices effectively. This can be particularly problematic if election officials or volunteers are not trained to communicate effectively with the people who have these disabilities, or if assistive technologies like sign language interpreters or audio voting machines are not available or functioning pro properly. These barriers not only make it more difficult for people with disabilities to vote, they also send a message that our voices and our votes don't matter. This is unacceptable and is a time for us to take action to ensure that every citizen can participate fully in our democracy. Fortunately, there are steps we can take to make our polling places more accessible. One important step is to ensure that all polling places are physically accessible. This can include features like the wheelchair ramps, wide doorways, and accessible voting machines that can be used by people with mobility or dexterity disabilities. It's also important to ensure that these features are properly maintained and functioning so that people with disabilities can use them with confidence and ease. Another important step is to provide training to election officials and volunteers on how to communicate effectively with people with disabilities. This can include training on how to use assistive technologies like sign language interpreters, braille and voting guides, or auto, audio voting machines, as well as how to communicate in a clear and concise manner with people who have hearing or speech impairment. This can help ensure that people with disabilities are able to understand the voting process and communicate their choices effectively and they feel comfortable and welcome when they go to vote. 
Finally, it's important to conduct outreach to communities of people with disabilities to ensure that they know their rights and understand how to access accommodations and assistance when they go to vote. This can include outreach through community organizations, social media, or other channels, as well as providing information and resources on accessible polling places, assistive technologies, and other accommodations that may be available. By taking these steps, we can make our democracy more inclusive and ensure that everyone has the opportunity to make their vote, votes count. And we can send a message to people with disabilities that their opinions and their votes matter and that we value their contribution to our democracy. And we can set an example for other states and communities around the country, showing them that what can be achieved when we work together to promote accessibility, inclusion, and equity for all. The Minnesota Council on Disability thanks Senator Hoffman for carrying this bill, and I urge members of this committee to prioritize accessibility at the voter polling places in Minnesota by supporting Senate File 2144. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turney. Mr. Turner, uh, Senator Hoffman. Uh, Mr. Justify? Chair, Nicole Freeman is here to, to, uh, to uh, finalize, and then uh, we'll sit for questions, or you can just pass it because it's a great bill and move it on to the next step. So I appreciate cool. that. So. Thanks for that opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Freeman, please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Nicole Freeman, Office of the Secretary of State. I'm here today uh, to uh, testify in support of this bill. Um, it offers needed needed funds uh, for our local election administrators uh, to uh, make improvements uh, to their polling places. Um, we've heard from a number of communities across the state that um, they need to replace or purchase new uh, ramps for polling locations, um, new accessible voting booths, um, and other uh, tools that they use to make their polling places more accessible uh, are in need of replacement. Um, in addition, uh, the, the Disability Law Center visits uh, polling places each statewide general election, um, and the challenges that Trevor just highlighted were occasionally found across the state, and so this funding would allow, um, would be welcome, and allow local uh, jurisdictions to um, shore up their polling locations. So thank you for supporting the bill uh, and helping to ensure that people across uh, the state can easily access their polling locations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Any amendments from the... Um, Senator Anderson. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Hoffman, or to your testifiers, could we more, be more specific in where, as far as for people with disabilities? I know that when my uh, wife decided to do uh, stay-at-home daycare uh, because she had a child in a wheelchair, my, my daughter and another child, that we had a list of things that had to be met by the county in, in re, to remodel. And I'm wondering if we could be more specific in, our, in your bill as to what voting places have to have uh, as a criteria uh, so that when they ask for the grant, there is specific items that they need to meet uh, in, in meeting that requirement. You want to do, because, uh, yeah, the reasonable accommodations under ADA, Nicole, Good. but that's Senator fine. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Anderson. And, and, and I'll first, um, the word is always used, what's a reasonable accommodation, right? Under, under If you're looking at accessibility, um, the ADA is not as prescriptive, right? But there are things within the grant um, here, and I'll let uh, Ms. Freeman talk about that. Like if you need to widen the doors, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a listing of things that are accessible under that. So Ms. Freeman. Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so there is a list of uh, accessibility requirements um, that uh, local jurisdictions use, a checklist uh, that's on our website that local jurisdictions use um, as they're evaluating a polling location. Um, and similar to you know current ADA standards, there are things that are um, required of any location and there are things that um, Yes, it sets the floor um, for what that what, what that standard is. Mr. Chair, Senator. Ms. Freeman, it doesn't say that in the bill, though. Hmm. It doesn't say anything about ADA standards or anything to that effect. It says people with disabilities, but it doesn't directly, specifically say how that those funds are to be used. So that's what I would like to have that further clarified if we could as we go forward. Uh, Senator Hoffman. You know, I, it, to that point, um, Mr. Chair, a lot of times we just make assumptions that everybody's going to understand what Title II, Title III of the ADA is, or Title I, and 
Senator Anderson is absolutely correct. We just assume everybody knows what the definition of free appropriate public education FAPE is. Nobody really understands public law 94142. I bet you if I quiz anybody on this table, they're not going to be able to spell out the historical relevance of that piece, right? We just assume that. And so in this case, I like what you're going with this, Senator Anderson. What What's the... Because we should have a thing in there that must be in compliance with, must have, right? I mean, to the point the Secretary of State's office does have a list of those things that are there. But really, you and I know what reasonable accommodation is because of our lived experience, uh, Senator Anderson. But to the average Joe reading this section one, does it say that? And the answer, I think, Senator Anderson's on something is no. It doesn't say that. So thank you for pointing that out. It should be more specific to what that means. In compliance with Title II of ADA, in compliance with Title III of ADA, Senator, Senator Anderson, that can be easily done in here. I think, don't you guys fall under the aspect of Title II of the ADA? Anybody who's a lawyer that understands the ADA? Well, the answer is yes, you do. But, the, but in this case, um, and I'm not even a lawyer, but I think in that case, something like that, uh, Senator, Mr. Chair, makes absolute sense because then it tells, specifically says, and if I'm being too prescriptive on that, I got these two experts to the side of me that would say so. But, but to Senator Anderson's point, he's correct. We just assume we know what that means. And you know what? The average Joe doesn't know what that means. And I mean the average Joe, meaning somebody who doesn't spend their time reading 1,700 pages of law. You know that. Senator Hoffman, are you uh, offering to uh, do an amendment? Um, I think Senator Anderson is, is right. I, I, I don't know. And, and maybe tell me where the next step is on this, Senator Carlson, because we could either fix it before that or we could do an oral amendment that just highlights. And we'd need, Trevor, if you want to think about that, would it be have to be consistent with Title II of the ADA? Is it Title II of the ADA? It is? So he's shaking my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you had in there. But Senator uh, Hoffman, we're going we're to be laying this bill over so we can, uh, we can make, uh, fix that up. Okay. Because you know, it's pretty, un pretty much, like you say, it's understood. Yep. So it's not ma a matter of discrepancy whether nope. there's something that we... Uh, I think you just add the language, you know, in, in okay. accordance with Title II of the ADA, comma, right? Then that's good. And do that before. You're going to lay it over. Can you do yep. this when you mark it up? That would be yep. wonderful. So okay. we have our wonderful... And she will not forget that. Good. I know that. But I want to thank Senator Anderson. Thank you for pointing the uh, obvious out. I appreciate you. I appreciate you doing that. So, yep. Mr. Chair, thank you for this. Thank you. Any other questions? Huh. <laughs> Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I'm totally empathetic to this. I, I just out of curiosity, I, I was trying to think. I've worked at probably seven different polling locations, and their churches, um, school, like public schools, city buildings. I I've never actually seen them be in a building that wasn't already ADA compliant. So this is just for my own curiosity. What sort of places are we having problems with with compliance that are election sites? Mr. Chair. To our testifiers, uh, who would like to take that answer? I think, Mr. Turner, I think you did say some of these, you know, for instance, the door widths, they, they things do like that. Um, do you have some idea of where these problems are cropping up? Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Senator Mitchell. I, you know, most of the, the issues come from, especially in uh, like rural Minnesota or uh, in greater Minnesota, those are, are going to be a lot of the issues because a lot of the buildings are older that, that predate the ADA. Um, any building that predates the ADA likely isn't uh, meeting the ADA standards. Um, any buildings that are remodeled or um, built after the ADA are ADA compliant, but anything predates then it's likely that there's going to be some inaccessibility in that building. Senator Mitchell, follow-up? Um, no, and I, again, I'm on board with this. I just, if, if it's a school, for example, if it's a school in greater Minnesota, they probably should have been getting ADA compliant regardless of their, mm -hmm. them being a, an election site. Um, again, I'm not trying to fight this in any way, shape, or form. I'm just in my head, like, trying to figure out, like, who isn't already following this that we would be using this as an election site. So it, it, it's my mere curiosity. Thank you. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. It makes sense. It's common sense, and I appreciate the conversation, and, and uh, thank you for 
letting us make it a reality. Thank you. Any other questions from the members? Okay, we'll be laying this one over. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. And our next one up here is Senate File 2171, uh, Senator Rest, and that's redistricting provisions for Metropolitan Council districts. No, we're doing it. I'm sorry. Do oh, I'm sorry. We're, yeah, we're going to. I skipped. It's fine. She's fine. Okay. Sure. Yeah, we've got uh, Senator Westland is, is next. Well, no, we'll do Senator wait, Rest. Wait, wait a second. Wait, which one? Yeah. Rest. Okay, we want to do Senator Rest. Okay, 2171, Senator Rest. Too many cooks. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and note, Senator Rest... We Thank have you. some space if you need to put the posters up at the two ends of the tables here. We have some space so that they can get onto the, the broad view, or I, I don't know if we have, we have the ability to zoom in on so you um, can read them. Mr. Chairman, I, I think we're fine. Okay. Um, members have the, um, the maps, um, and I'll be referring to them, and if the camera can pick them up fine. Okay. <clears throat> Senator Rest, uh, Senate file 2171. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we're at the end of the committee. If someone wants to go up, we'll leave them there until we're finished. Okay. And then you can go and uh, look Please at Please be them. sure to pull the mic close to you. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senate and file. And speak loudly, please. <laughs> I'll do my best. Senate file 2171 is the. Um, uh, responds to a requirement that in the um, uh, year that ends in three, that the Metropolitan Council um, has to present a redistricting um, um, proposal for the 16 Metropolitan Council districts, which this year um, are approximately 198 um, thousand people each. Um, the growth in um, the seven county metropolitan area, which is what is covered by Mount Council, um, has been uh, expanding this last decade um, by, um, by over 10 percent. So the um, maps are going to look a little bit different. However, um, there is um, permitted uh, in order to preserve uh, what in other redistricting um, discussions are communities of interest and in this instance trying to preserve um, uh, cities that uh, so that any given city can be within the uh, a Met Council, uh, a same Met, Met Council district. Once the um, redistricting plan has been um, approved and signed into law by the governor, then the governor is required to appoint the members to the Met Council um, within, uh, within 60 days. So um, we're trying to, by moving the bill on, and, and um, there will be a, a motion um, to move the bill to transportation. Um, and there is a date that I have to enter as an author's amendment. I have the A1 amendment, which I move now. Senator Rest offers the A1 amendment. And I believe this is the, your first committee, so this is an author's amendment. Yes. The pages are now handing it out. So we'll okay, have it. Senator Ress, would you like to describe the amendment while it's being handed out? Well, if you see, um, if you look at the bill, um, the um, there is on line uh, 111, there's a blank, needs a date, um, and that date was February 27th. The, um, this... 
the maps, which is what the requirement is, which is what is not described here. The requirement is that they are they have to be published, and they were published on um, February 27th, 2023, meeting the requirement for putting them on the website. So, Senator Rest, you are uh, you're merely adding a date when it is to be published, and that date has. Um, passed and it was in, and they were indeed published on that date so it's a okay. retroactive date from right now but that's the date in which they were published on the website which is the the uh, requirement the same thing happens when we have our legislative districts um, uh, we've moved to a system of um, uh, publishing them on the GIS for the for the legislature same thing here so, members, this is an author's amendment. Uh, it's the A1 amendment that uh, Senator Rest offers. All in, all in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator thank, Rest. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And if you look on, on the uh, summary, uh, it is the where the website is is um, is published there. So that's where it's available. Uh, in um, uh, in section in section uh, one that has just been referred to, um, Mr. Chairman, the reason that I have a particular interest in this bill um, that is shared with Representative Freiberg, uh, chair of the Elections Committee in the other body, is that um, ten years ago uh, he and I voted no. <laughs> on the redistricting plan because um, the redistricting plan placed um, the small suburb of, um, of Robbinsdale, 10, 11,000 people, um, inside um, the city of Minneapolis, uh, or with Minneapolis. And uh, since that time, uh, there has been um, a real um, uh, discomfort on the part of the folks of Robbinsdale uh, to the extent that um, a couple of years ago there was a resolution um, sent by the City Council of Robbinsdale and its mayor to Met Council saying, please, the next time we do uh, redistricting, do not include um, Robbinsdale with uh, the city of Minneapolis. The member from uh, for that district uh, lived in South Minneapolis, and sometimes we felt that he didn't even know where Robbinsdale was, or it was, you know, um, uh, a um, a western section of Minis of of Minneapolis. Well, of course, the people of Robbinsdale resented that, um, and so. Um, this time, Met Council and its redistricting got it right, and um, uh, the, uh, you have both maps, I believe, in front of you showing before where, Minneap where Robbinsdale was part of Minneap Minneapolis District, but I believe that now the one that is, um, that is uh, MC2023-1 is... Um, is uh, really does represent a gathering together communities of interest, and that is the small, the small or medium-sized suburbs uh, together because their interests are certainly more in line with one another than any of them are with the, um, with the city of Minneapolis. And so that new district is, um, is number six. It's not, it's not any more complicated than that. Um, when, the, when this is passed, and you can look to see where your suburbs um, uh, come in, or I, um, I'm looking to see here, I don't believe there's anybody that represents Minneapolis on this committee or even a part of it. So uh, those that are uh, uh, in a metropolitan um, uh, council district are um, are on this are on these maps. It is the seven county 
um, the seven county area. That's it. Thank you, Senator Rest. I, I may be mistaken, but I think I have three identical maps that all show Robin's Look for the one that says 2023, and I believe um, I can't see them too ah. well. No, I've got um, it, Senator Rest. That's the 2023 one um, to my right, and I believe that's the 2013 one. Okay, so thank you. All, all the... Um, all the requirements have been met now by Met Council in bringing the redistricting to us. We just have to pass it and then send it to the governor. And then again, um, once he signs it, he has 60 days to um, name the um, name the new members. And the reason, another reason why that's important is that the current districts continue <laughs> until the new district comes about, and. Um, uh, and we want that to reflect the, uh, the, this change in population over over um, uh, over the seven county uh, area, and um, and it, and if we had had a new governor, that the new governor uh, would have been appointing these folks um, as quickly as as possible to. Uh, represent his priorities or her priorities. So that's why we're now that we have the maps that we would like to move um, um, as reasonably quick as possible to get this to the governor's desk. Thank you, Thank you Senator Rest. And I believe we do have a, a testifier from Met Council, Mr. Judd. Well, Mr. Shecknan is, is present to answer, oh, questions. Answer, he's, answer questions. He's not here so to testify. Do we have some questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Rest. So, was it was it your city council or your mayor or a group of citizens that came to the redistricting board to, to object to where you were located last time, or how did that all how did that process work, um, Senator Rest? Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Anderson, it's not my city. I live in New Hope, but um, uh, Robbinsdale is certainly a. Um, uh, uh, one of the cities in my legislative district, but um, their objection had nothing to do with who their legislator was. <laughs> it had to do with they passed a, they passed a resolution um, saying how dissatisfied ten years ago they were um, as a small suburb um, it, that borders Minneapolis, just lumped in with Minneapolis, and then. They didn't get the Met Council member. South, South Minneapolis got the Met Council member, and um, their interests just did not coincide. And they asked specifically the mayor and the, and the, um, uh, and the city council through a resolution for when Met Council did their redistricting maps, please include Robbinsdale with um, the other suburbs that it borders rather than bringing them into a district that where they would be swallowed up by the interests of Minneapolis. So, Mr. Chair, oh, Senator, Senator Rest, that was that resolution then w went to the redistricting board of the. Um, it went to Met Council. Met Council does the. Uh, Met, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator, uh, Senator Anderson, Met Council um, submits their own. Um, uh, I don't think they, there's no redistricting board. Um, they may have a subcommittee that recommends to Met Council themselves um, uh, their proposal for um, uh, uh, redistricting. Same thing happens with, um, uh, with counties that have different commissioner districts as well. It's the responsibility of the, of the, of the local unit which in that case would be uh, Hennepin County from, from my perspective, and and here, um, Met Council itself. So Madam Chair, um, Ma Senator Mr. Anderson. Chair, uh, Senator Rest, so it's a subcommittee of the Met Council, I mean, where they've designated three or four or six, however many, and I, they become the... I don't, Mr. Chairman, Senator, Senator Anderson, Rest. I don't know um, the process they went through. It might have even been a staff function um, that they asked um, members of, their, of the Met Council staff or something to present plans to Met Council for um, redistricting purposes that Met 
having nearly um, uh, dividing the 16 districts into populations approximately 198,000 people, keeping in mind that uh, trying not to split cities, to have a city only within one Met Council district, and then the Met Council approves this, and then they send it to, they post it like they did February 27th, and then the bill comes here because we have to approve it and the governor has to sign the bill. Thank you. Um, Mr. Anderson. Chair, uh, could council tell us what the uh, repealer is? The repealer, is, uh, Senator, Anderson, Senator Anderson, is the 2013 plan. Sorry, Senator oh. Rest. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Question answered. Okay. So, Mr. Senator Chairman, I would, I would um, move Senate File 2171 as amended be recommended to pass and sent to the Committee on Transportation. Okay, we'll, we'll do that. We did have one prior request for questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Senator Grant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Rest, uh, um, I think the intent, or I just want clarification, but it looked like the repealer, um, E, uh, repealed the appointments of the Council subject to advice and consent of the Senate. Um, if you read the current statute, I just, if, if staff could... Uh, Validate that the repealer is just repealing the old and inserting the new. I just um, like confirmation. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Coran, if Senator you look Rest. at the bill, it repeals um, section 473.123, subdiv only subdivision 3E. And subdivision 3E is simply the district boundaries, nothing more than that. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Or, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> thank you, Senator Rust. <laughs> can, can we have counsel verify that that's what re the repealer does? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, Senator that is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? We, we have a... Senator Barr, did you have a question? Oh, he was pointing at you, Senator Cran, I think. <laughs> okay, good. All right. We have a motion from Senator Rest, uh, and maybe Senator Rest, could you repeat your motion? Sure. I, I move that um, Senate File 2171, as amended, be recommended to pass and um, be sent to the Committee on Transportation. Senator Rest moves Senate File 2171, as amended, be uh, recommended to pass and forwarded to the Transportation Committee. All in, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. The motion is adopted. Thank you, Senator Rest. Now we have Senate File 1434, Senator Westland. We do have one remote testifier as well. Senator Westland, proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as, uh, so I, we have an author's amendment, <laughs> and we have a second amendment to the author's amendment. So um, the A3 amendment, uh, Mr. Chair, is actually a delete everything, and after um, that particular amendment was prepared, there were a couple of um, additional minor um, changes or corrections uh, but maybe we should do the A3 first. Okay. And this is uh, your first committee, so A3 can be your author's amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, that's a freebie. So all those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The amendment, the amendment is adopted. Now you have and another think, amendment? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. And just I, I think um, from my perspective, I think it's easier to just take care of all of this and then we'll walk through the whole thing at once. But there is an A4 amendment as a, well. A 
four A4. Amendment. A4. Uh, Senator Westland offers the A4 amendment to uh, Senate File 1434. Uh, amended. All, any questions on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The amendment is adopted. Senator Westland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And as we go through, um, there was there was one more spot um, that we noticed also needed to be um, changed, and I'll, I'll cover that when we get to it and probably just do an oral amendment at that time. Um, so thank you, members. I appreciate your time today. Uh, as we all know, we've had absentee, um, no excuse, absentee voting for some time. And what this bill does is it establishes um, in essence, in-person early voting as another option for um, voters to take advantage of the opportunity to vote prior to Election Day. And I will, um, I'll go through and do a walkthrough, uh, Mr. Chair, if that's all right. And um, we do have, <laughs> Ms. Freeman is always here to have my back if there are questions that I can't answer. Uh, but uh, we'll start with a walkthrough. Um, a lot of the... Uh, Parts of this, uh, the early parts of this are sort of technical um, changes to language. Section one, Mr. Chair and members, um, requires that the statewide voter registration system um, provide reports for early voting. Uh, so that language has been added. Section two um, states that it adds early voting, uh, that election laws apply to early voting as it does to absentee ballot voting. Section three adds the definition of early voting, and this is a little bit different from the original bill um, because it actually refers to, um, it makes um, statutory references, but early voting in essence is voting in person before election day um, as provided by the authorizing um, statute. Section four, um, in essence, states that the same um, actions that would be a violation of absentee voting would also be violations uh, within the context of early voting. Section five applies limits to which cities can administer early voting um, as being the same as uh, administering absentee balloting. Section six is actually um, the part that I would uh, will be making an oral amendment for. Section six actually needs to be deleted from the bill because townships um, would not have uh, early voting under this bill. So you can make a note that we will be, there will be an oral amendment to um, remove that section. Section seven clarifies that um, the section requires certain hours for absentee voting um, that, sorry, the section that requires certain hours for absentee voting do not apply to elections using early voting because we have uh, different um, we have different terms for that. Section eight requires jurisdictions using early voting to establish a ba ballot board. Section nine. Um, is the part that ensures that the statewide voter registration system will be marked when a voter has voted early. It also states that that voter then is prohibited from voting again. And it moves up the timeline for processing absentee ballots to the day before early voting starts. Section 10 um, includes another um, change to timelines. So section 11, 12, 13, 14, so forth, actually are the major portions of this bill. Um, the prior sections primarily incorporate early voting uh, into prior statute. So section 11 requires early voting uh, be used in federal, state, and county elections, and it allows cities to opt into using that process. Section 12 uh, combines two sections from the bill as it was originally introduced. Um, we sort of combined those items. It sets the time period for early voting. We originally had proposed 30 days prior to election day and after receiving input from 
stakeholders that has been shortened. So early voting would be 18 days before the election up until 3 p.m. the day before the election. Um, and the number of days that we're using and the uh, ending at 3 p.m. rather than 5 p.m. again were requests that were made by local election offic officials. So when we were we were looking at amending the original language in the bill, uh, those changes were incorporated at the request of stakeholders. Uh, we that section also does require. Um, that early voting is offered from 9 p.m. to 3, sorry, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. for three Saturdays during the early voting period, the Sunday before the election, and then local uh, authorities can choose a single weeknight um, for voting until 8 p.m. They can choose which day that is, but it needs to be the same day each week so that there's consistency and voters know uh, what that um, late voting, weekday voting is. Section 13 also combines uh, two sections from the bill as it was originally introduced. It requires early voting be held in the county auditor's offices and city clerk offices for the entire early voting period, but it also does allow them to designate additional locations, sort of pop-up locations, where they can uh, make voting available during the early voting period. It also requires information be posted on the Secretary of State, County, and City websites or published in the paper if a jurisdiction doesn't have a website. The A4 amendment, um, which we passed, also changes the notice requirement to the Secretary of State to 46 days. Uh, and that was originally um, 14 days, but we expanded that. Section 14 sets out the procedures for early voting and includes um, significantly more details than was part of the bill as it was originally introduced. And this is to ensure that we have uniformity statewide in the process and that it mirrors procedures that are actually used on election day or that are already used with in-person absentee voting. It requires the voter to state their name and address and upon request their birth date their voter registration is looked up on the uh, statewide voter registration system to ensure it's accurate. If it is not accurate, uh, then they would do a same day registration to update it. If they have already voted as noted in the uh, voter registration system, then they will be told that they cannot vote and they will be turned away. Uh, the voter would sign the same oath as they do on election day, and they are given a ballot, which they will then mark. And after completing the ballot, it actually does um, go into the ballot counter. The ballots are removed at the end of the day using procedures already in law for in-person direct absentee balloting. They're counted on the night of, of the election by the ballot board using procedures already in law for absentee ballots. The A4 amendment that was offered actually um, change the language or tweak the language on 8.5 and 8.6 to ensure the intent was clear. Basically, previously it was sort of passive language. It said after signing the voter certification, we have now changed it to after the voter signs the certification. Um, section 15 sets the timeline for county auditors to provide election materials to city clerks for early voting at least one day before it starts. Section 16 sets the timeline for finalizing the programming for ballot counters and assistive voting uh, equipment at uh, 36 days before the election so that it's ready to start um, when early voting begins. Section 17 sets the deadline for testing voting equipment and provides flexibility requested by local election officials so that it is all tested at least three days before it will be used. Section 18 is the appropriation. Um, it's relatively, has a relatively m minimal um, fiscal note. Section 19 repeals the current procedure that we use with direct absentee balloting. And then section 20 makes this bill effective upon certification by the Secretary of State that the statewide voter registration system has the needed capability 
It could then be used in elections after January 1st of 2024, but only those at least 85 days after the certification to ensure that the requirement doesn't kick in partway through, the, um, through an election cycle. Um, so that is the walkthrough of the process. And again, um, we do direct absentee voting uh, currently, and what this does is it provides a specific early voting time period, 18 days before election. It allows people to complete their ballot, to submit it into um, a device, uh, a ballot counting device, uh, and we believe that this will um, uh, be just one other means for voters to be able to uh, exercise their right to vote, um, but do so in a way that they are watching their ballot being fed into a ballot machine rather than sending it absentee through the mail. Senator Weston, you mentioned that, Senator Weston, you mentioned that Section 6, uh, you would like to move to delete that section, is that Yes, right? Mr. Chair. Again, uh, I will just say that um, our, our amazing staff uh, are constantly working on these bills to make sure that they are in the correct shape. Um, and it was noticed as we were finalizing our preparation for today uh, that, that that section should be removed because it does not apply, early voting does not apply to uh, townships. Um, I have joked with staff that I, I'm wondering if all of these changes are part of the hazing um, that one has as a freshman legislator on the elections committee. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Senator Westman moves to uh, uh, have an oral amendment to delete section six on page four. Any questions on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. The motion is adopted. And Senator Westland, you have some testifiers. Would you like to bring those up? Um, I believe, uh, Mr. Chair, we have one uh, individual testifying remotely. Okay. We have Ms. De Debbie Erickson from Crow Wing County. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Debbie Erickson. I am the Crow Wing County Administrative Services Director. However, I'm here today in my capacity as president of the Minnesota Association of County Officers. MACO represents all 87 county auditors, treasurers, recorders, and finance officers, and all election administrators. One of MACO's legislative guiding principles is the fair and impartial stewardship of elections through legislation that enhances the efficiency and administration of elections. And MACO supports the efficiencies created with Senate File 1434, implementing early voting. Under current law, all voters who vote prior to election day are absentee voters and are required to complete an application to receive a ballot, even when they are voting in person through the method known as direct balloting that allows a voter to place their ballot into the tabulator rather than using the envelope method. Many voters already believe that when they come to the county office to vote in person during the direct balloting period, they are voting early, not voting absentee. With the enactment of true early voting, voters will have the same experience and process whether they vote in person at the elections office or at the polling place, clearing up some of the misconceptions and streamlining the process for election administrators. MACO appreciates Senator Westland considering our feedback and offering the amendment to reduce the early voting period to 18 days prior to election day. Equipment programming, ballot preparation, and equipment testing and certification must be completed prior to the start of voting. And while 18 days will shorten our current window to complete these tasks, we believe this is an achievable time frame. Additionally, MACO supports closing early voting no later than 3 p.m. on the day preceding the election. These few extra hours will allow valuable time to ensure that all polling place rosters are uploaded and materials prepared for election day. Finally, I want to express concern with the mandatory hours required in Section 12. MACO recognizes that local election administrators best understand the needs of their communities and voters. And we do want to note that the added hours proposed would cost, add cost burdens to many counties in additional overtime and create staffing challenges in many places. 
and in many cases with few or no voters served in those additional hours. While expanded hours may be needed in a general election, most often in a primary election, there is not enough voter demand to recommend additional hours. In fact, in my county of almost 50,000 registered voters, the current Saturday hours required by law have frequently resulted in fewer than 10 voters served when the primary ballot is smaller. Adding additional Saturdays, additional weeknights, and required Sunday hours would not be the best use of local resources if there isn't the voter demand for it. MACO's preference would be to have one required non-business hour date, like the Saturday requirement in current law, and local determination of any additional hours to not be restricted. If a county determines there is a local need for adding additional evening or weekend hours, they should be allowed to offer them as needed. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chair and members. I encourage your support of Senate File 1434 and your consideration of some additional changes to best meet the needs across the state. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Erickson. Uh, uh, just for everyone's information, this bill will be laid over, and so there will be an opportunity to do some polishing. So thank you for your testimony. Uh, Senator Westman, next testifier. Um, I believe Mike Dean. Mr. Dean, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and who you're representing and continue with your testimony. Great. Thank you, Chair Carlson, members of the committee. My name is Mike Dean. I'm the executive director of LEAD MN. We represent the 100,000 community and technical college students in the state of Minnesota. I'm here today to uh, urge you to support Senate File 1434 because it will make voting more accessible to every Minnesotan, but also to community college students. Since no excuse absentee voting was approved a decade ago, more and more Minnesotans uh, vote, on, um, vote on a day that's most convenient for them. Uh, then in 2020, voting ex early voting exploded because of the pandemic. Uh, we have numbers of, back in 2018, 67% of students at the University of Minnesota voted on election day. And then in 2020, that number shrank down to 30%, so almost cut in half. So we see a huge increase in early voting. Uh, and another college, Central Lakes College uh, in Minnesota, students voted in person at 86% in 2018, and then that decreased to 61% in 2020. We hear from students that they want options in when they vote. Some like voting on election day, others have to work and need to find more convenient times uh, to vote for themselves. That's why we appreciate section, um, the section that really allows cities and counties to open up early voting locations. This clarifies an important part of state law, um, and it makes it clear that it would allow cities and counties to open up these pop-up voting locations at senior centers, at community centers, and also at community colleges. We piloted such an idea back in 2018 at St. Paul College in Ramsey County, and that helped over 250 students vote and actually boosted the campus voter turnout by five percentage points. Uh, this election site actually brought students into a room and helped them be prepared for voting by checking to see if they were registered. They could view a sample ballot um, to see who was on the election and look up information on the candidates. Uh, this created a fun environment on the campus and it was an enjoyable experience that really created lifelong student voters. Uh, after the success of this effort, the vast majority of community colleges and campuses have expressed interest in bringing this to their own college, but current state law does not allow that to happen. We thank Senator Westland for bringing forward this bill to make voting more accessible, safe, and secure in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Uh, Senator Westland, you have uh, uh, the Secretary of State's office on the list as well. Yes. Uh, Ms. Nicole Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Please identify yourself and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Nicole Freeman, Office of the Secretary of State. Uh, thanks to you, uh, Chair and uh, Senator Westland, for um, bringing this bill to us today. Uh, early voting provides an additional flexibility for voters uh, who wish to vote in person, allowing them to stop in when it's convenient for them during the 18 days before Election Day. It gives them the peace of mind knowing that their ballot was accepted then and there um, before they leave that early vote center. Not only is the process advantageous to voters, but it also streamlines the administration of voting before election day. I think you heard um, much more details on that uh, and the benefits uh, from Debbie Erickson. The safeguards and checks and balances in our system that exist on election day are all present through this early voting process as well. 
The Office of the Secretary of State ap appreciates the expansion of early voting hours across the state. Um, and while we applaud this expansion, we also ask the committee to consider, um, we ask the committee to consider going back to uh, the 5 p.m. stop time on the Monday before the election. Um, so early voting would go until 5 p.m. on the Monday before the election. Voters have told us that they prefer voting in circumstances that mirror election day conditions, um, but at times and on more days that are uh, more convenient for them. They've done this by turning out uh, to absentee vote in person in high numbers during the week prior to election day when local jurisdictions may offer direct balloting. Thanks again to Senator Westland and the committee for considering this change and this office asks for your support. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Uh, members of the committee, uh, uh, Senator Mitchell has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to clarify I have everything correct, and then I, I do have a couple areas of feedback slash questions. So for an area that is already doing the absentee in person, which a lot of us call early, but it's absentee in person, we would still do that from 42 to 19 days out. And then at day 18, it would switch to the early where you would, instead of filling out the form and having it in the envelope, you would be putting it in the machine going until the day before the election. Is that correct? Senator Westland. Mr. Chair, Senator Mitchell, that is correct. Okay. Um, I would Senator like to, Mitchell. sorry. I would like to say I agree with um, Ms. Freeman saying that we should still end at five o'clock on the Monday prior to the election. Um, just as feedback, because I have heard from one of my friends who is an election judge, I didn't do this past election, but she said she had longer lines on that Monday than the actual Tuesday of election day. So I think continuing to have it until five would be advantageous. And then my final question regard is in regards to the repealer um, that says it will remove some of the deposit boxes. So if we go into this period of early voting, um, right now when you're in absentee early voting, someone can bring it in and drop it right in the box at the same time. I would guess that in this period of what will now officially be early voting, some people might do the same thing, which is um, a husband would come in and he would come to vote himself, but he would also be bringing his wife's absentee ballot in the envelope, for example. So does this repealer take out the deposit boxes entirely, or what would happen during that period? Senator Westman. Mr. Chair, I'll defer to <laughs> Ms. Ms. Freeman. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Mitchell. Uh, so the repealer actually just, uh, the repealer repeals direct balloting and replaces it in effect to replace it with early voting. So um, uh, drop boxes that a county auditor might have at their polling location, or sorry, inside their building, um, or you know, if someone has a drop box outside, those are, those are all not dealt with in this bill or, or touched in this bill. The, I'm sorry, they're, they're knocked out or they will remain? They are, they are not touched in this okay, bill. Okay, sorry, thank you. Senator Mitchell, any more? Okay. Thank you. It's Senator Limmer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, testifiers today want us to rely on a statement they made, quote unquote, voters have told us, end quote, their voting preferences. Can you uh, expand on that of how that, how that is quantified? Senator Mr. Westland. Chair, Senator Limmer, was that um, Ms. Erickson? That was our Secretary of State uh, testifier oh. that's sitting next to you right mm -hmm. now. I missed that part. <laughs> Ms. <laughs> Mr. <Freeman>. Chair. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer. Um, so what I meant by that statement was that, uh, similar to what Senator Mitchell said, that the lines, uh, the participation in early vote, or excuse me, the participation in absentee in-person voting on the Monday before the election um, is the most 
the highest day um, of any of the days of the absentee period. Um, and so that was, that was my statement. Okay. Uh, I Mitchell. guess I got confused. I thought that Senator. was a reference Senator. to build a foundation for the direction of a new policy. Um, and I'd, I'd have to question how that's tabulated or is that a scientific poll? Uh, how many people in the in that uh, quantity you relied on to come to that conclusion? I, I guess I'm I'm hearing that often in uh, in this committee, and it finally kind of caught up to me that I've heard it a number of times. Uh, I'd just like to see how it's quantified. Senator Westland, or Senator Mitt, sorry, <laughs> Senator Westland, or uh, Ms. Friedman. No. You have a response for that? Uh, thank you, Chair Carlson. Um, so that is a number that is, uh, that I did not bring with me to committee, um, but it is in the statewide voter registration system. So that's where, that's where we're getting the data from. Um, I'm happy to send that around to the committee uh, after this. Um, I'll, I'll look forward to that, Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you. Pardon me, Senator Lemon? I'll look forward to receiving oh. that information. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Ms. Freeman, yeah, we'll look forward to getting that information. Yes. Senator Cran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, there's many questions. I'll start with just a few. Um, it seems like a lot of changes for an election system that we've heard consistently that is amazing and works wonderfully and everybody loves it. Um, Senator Westland, you, always, you keep using the term uh, election day. I don't see an election day anywhere in the bill <laughs> because it's moving into a, what looks to be a more complicated season. Um, one of the areas, and when we move to the 18th day, when we're moving to the early, early balloting in person, it looks like they're going to a live ballot. Is that correct? Ms. Freeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, so currently, uh, the section of statute that's being repealed in this bill allows um, folks to use an alternative method to absentee vote and um, directly deposit their ballot into a tabulator right now. Okay. Mr. Chair. Senator, Senator Grant. And so with the 18 days um, when, when it starts, what does the chain of command look like and the controlled custody or the, the data? Because we haven't done to my understanding that they've run them through the ballots for 18 days ahead of time, or run them through tabulars 18 days ahead of time. What data, what's the time frame and what's the data and when, does the, when do the results um, get sent to the Secretary of State? Ms. Freeman. Sure, thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Cran. Uh, so, um, I, I don't have the section. I'll, I'll look in a second and, and reference the exact section. But um, what that section details is that uh, at the end of the night, um, the election officials who are administering this process um, are to uh, essentially tally out, make sure the, the ballots match the number of people who voted that day. Um, those ballots are then secured, um, just as all other absentee ballots are. Uh, the tabulator, then there is no counting of the ballots that happens. Um, the tabulator essentially, similar to how it, it counts the ballots all of the hours of the election day, um, it, is, it is consistently tabulating over the course of those 18 days. And then on election day, um, at the close of election, at the after 8 p.m. on election day is when those results are, I'm not using the, downloaded essentially, uh, and then are processed and sent to the Secretary of State's office. So it's nothing is counted until after 8 p.m. on election day. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Or, sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, follow Senator um, thank you, Ms. Freeman. And, uh, and then um, I think I lost my, my uh, train of thought. Um, the custody and control is good. Um, oh, so today... Um, somebody could change their, change their vote who voted early up to, up to the day before the election day. How is that procedure accommodated? Mr. Chair, I, I'll briefly Senator answer, and, and Ms. Freeman can answer. So that is true of absentee voting. 
um, if you directly, if you if you use early voting, you cannot change your vote. Once you once you put it in the machine, it's in the machine. So that is a distinction between absentee and, and early voting. Mr. Chair, thank you, Senator Westland. And so okay. that that early vote option does nullify if, and when you're 18 days out. If you haven't made a request for an absentee ballot, you are nullified then. You can vote early, but you would not have the ability to change your vote if for some reason a plane crashed, which I think the reason we actually have that language in there, or some extenuating circumstance. So um, from 18 days out, if you chose that in-person early voting option, um, you would not have the ability to change that regardless of what happened um, to the candidates up to Election Day. Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, so uh, currently the dubbed clawback period uh, ends seven days before the election uh, when the direct balloting period begins and when absentee ballot boards can begin processing those ballots um, because then those ballots are separated from the signature envelope and the, the ballot envelope. Um, uh, and then uh, to the question about sort of what would happen in, if, in an extenuating circumstance, um, I think that it would, uh, as we've seen from uh, court action in, in the most recent election um, around the death of a candidate um, after a candidate filing, uh, it, it seems like the, there would need to be a court remedy um, and the courts would have to address that. Uh, it's, um, we attempted to, in Minnesota, address that, uh, and the, the court has said that, that doesn't, our, uh, our attempt at addressing that issue uh, doesn't apply in federal races. So if that was the case, it would need to go um, to court. Mr. Chair. Senator Grant. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. I appreciate that answer. Um, on the, well, I guess one quick, has a local impact statement been asked for or requested, or do you intend to ask for one? Because it, it appears it would be, somewhat resource intense or change it fairly significantly for those managing elections. The fiscal note looks pretty small and it looks like that's only for um, the Secretary of State's needs. Ms. Westland, do you have an answer for that? Um, Senator Quirin, from what I understand, the local impact has not uh, been requested. Thank Typically, you, Mr. Chair. I would, I would ask that we do request one. It, it, it seems like a fairly sizable impact on all, all those who manage elections that you've now added 18 day, or added many days um, to their in-person and the change in procedures and processes. Then, Mr. Chair, I have another question if you're Senator Quirin. ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the... Uh, I think it's uh, page section 13 uh, C. It really is about this whole pop-up locations. And I, I think part of your introduction, Senator Westland talked about um, the required to delineate election locations and we need to do those as early as possible. I think elections are really important and I think everyone must know um, well in advance because it's very difficult to communicate with people um, in short term, even though we have all the technology in the world. And so I, I don't think pop-up locations, even that you have to define them 46 days, um, I think it says 46 days uh, before election, but you're still counting election as, an, as a day, and assuming that was election day, that it would have to be done. But 46 days is actually the beginning of election. And I think all entities or all polling locations should be defined or de de defined and identified well in advance of what is listed here. And so I, I don't have, I don't see a great need. I think if there are multiple locations that are needed, they should be identified long before we even get close to election months, if not the uh, the year prior. Um, so they can be clearly identified, printed, and everybody understands what all those options are. If it's colleges, wherever it is, they should be known and they should be public for, for many people to make sure that we know where they're at so we have transparency and oversight. And so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make an oral amendment to uh, delete line seven and section 13 
um, page 7, line 11, through um, page 7, line 14, and request a roll call. Mr. Chairman, I don't, I don't understand where the amendment is starting on the... Um... On page 7. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Senator Green. Yeah, page of the, de that is. of the um, delete, delete. Oh, on the on the on the delete all, yes. On the A three uh, delete all amendment. Senator Rust essentially it strikes um, seven, section C and okay. removes the ability for pop up uh, pop up voting centers with the limited time frame for notification. Thank you, Mr. Perhaps uh, council can repeat the motion and tell us exactly where it uh, starts and ends. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Looking at the A3 delete everything amendment on page 7, delete lines 11 through 14, and on page 7, line 15, delete paragraph the letter D and insert the letter C. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Ms. Chair. Mr. Chairman. Senator Rest. Uh, Senator Coran, could you, could you explain um, your amendment again and the reason for it? And, and what's a pop-up thing? <laughs> Where does that say pop-up? Mr. Chair. Senator Coran. That's Senator Rest. The, um, I think that was a term that was used by one of the testifiers as well. The, but the... Uh, the ability to define many locations and during in with the notification here we've seen pop-up locations you come into a college campus for a day and I see. and I see. okay and, I see. I and to me now. um if we're going to do those things or, or we need many more locations okay. i just think the notification period needs to be um six months eight months ten months in advance so it's normalized so all printed communications about that election are uh are widely distributed and provide the transparency for everyone who provides oversight and those who want to participate and vote in those locations. Senator West Westland, uh, what's your opinion on this? So, Mr. Chair, um, I know that this bill is going to be laid over, and um, we certainly heard feedback from Ms. Erickson and others about some parts of this bill that um, that we certainly can continue to work on. Um, I would prefer to follow that process rather than pass this amendment at this time. Um, I have not had an opportunity to talk to um, the stakeholders and other folks um, who helped uh, prepare this bill. And so I, I, would, I do not support the amendment at this time, uh, but I would be happy to work with Senator Cran and any other members of the committee who may have concerns about any parts of this bill to see if we can um, get it into a shape that everyone can support. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Uh, Senator Mitchell uh, has a question. <laughs> um, I have a concern with this amendment because I think one of the things that would be covered under this is in my community, for example, there are two assisted living communities and senior centers that are not regular polling locations that they go out to about two weeks before election so that those seniors who would not otherwise be able to make it to the polls um, can vote at their facilities. It would be almost impossible to um, put a date for that six months out because my understanding of the way it works is they find the election officials, you know, the extra people that are gonna be working, they have to work around the schedule of the nursing home facilities and everything else. And, and so that's kind of something that comes together maybe a month in advance. But I think that would be one example of something where it's very valuable to have, in addition to your set sites, an early voting site that is open, for example, for one day where the people who are affected for it do know that enough in advance that they're able to take advantage of it, but without something like a six-month notice. So I actually believe that we should keep in the um, flexibility for the county to be able to have some of this early voting going on at additional sites. Mr. Chair. Senator Cram. Senator Mitchell, I, I think those, that scenario you described, I think, is certainly one we want to keep available, but I think that's also available in other portions of the statutes. 
in where it's not a, a polling place where the public is going to come in, but to serve the residents in, those, in that community or in that uh, facility. So I don't think that's this portion would affect it. Because I believe it's covered in other procedures from elections and how, how we can go out and assist in those facilities, the collection of their ballots. Thank you, Senator Grant. Senator Westman. I, um, Mr. Chair, I would just say, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Cran and members, um, the idea of these quote unquote pop, pop up um, locations is that, that they're trying to provide additional opportunities that are sort of beyond the set uh, voting places. Again, we've heard about colleges and so forth, but again, I would just simply reiterate. Um, I, you, I'm not saying that the point that you're raising isn't a good point. I just haven't had time to sort of process the implications um, for this bill and for our stakeholders. And uh, I, I would certainly like to work with you to see if there's something we can do to address your concerns. Senator Grant, would you like to take a vote on your motion? or would I would, you like Mr. To work Chair. On? Pardon me? I would, Mr. Chair, yes. Roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Okay. Senator Cran, uh, offers the oral amendment to delete lines uh, 711 to 714. Uh, oh, Senator, Senator. Before, before we ask a uh, question, could I ask a question? I'm sure you can. Um, Senator Limmer. I was concerned about this myself. Uh, who would administrate the locations of where a pop-up polling place would occur? Mr. Chair. Senator Westman. Um, so under the terms of language, it says the county auditor or the municipal clerk. Uh, Senator Limmer. Quite honestly, I think a lot of mischief could be created by such a process if pop-up polling places just happened to be in key precincts where one party or another might have a very dominant uh, uh, voting history toward one side of the political parties versus another? And how would you assure that there's an integrity involved in that location process? Um, I'm not sure if an auditor is the best person. They, they study things after the fact. And uh, could there be a little skullduggery in the process? Skullduggery. Uh, is, is this process? Skull having the virtue that we want, uh, or could it be abused? Maybe a polling place in a college campus or a precinct that's heavily voting in one favor of a political party uh, would be located but nowhere else in a political district. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering What's wrong with the uh, existing polling places that could be used? So could someone answer that question for me? Mr. Chair, I'll give it a, a quick jab, and then um, Ms. Freeman can respond as well. Um, they, they do have to post all of the proposed poll, uh, these polling places um, publicly, and they also have to provide the information, my understanding is, to the Secretary of State's office 46 days ahead of time. It has to be posted on the county's website. Uh, and, and so it, it is published and it is provided prior, prior to um, the location coming live, if you will. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and. Uh, Senator Limmer, I think, I guess my comments on your question are that the county auditor and the municipal clerk are administering early voting. That is their job pursuant to the statute, I think it's 203B.30, like that is what they are doing. So at some point we either trust our local elections officials to run elections in a way that complies with the law or we don't. They are already setting up the early voting locations. This is a part of that job to ensure that they are meeting the needs of the community. Um, I think to sort of imply that our local elections officials might be acting in nefarious ways is 
problematic in a different way, but uh, you know, I think this is intended, and you know, the author can can verify this or not, but intended to make sure that we are meeting the needs of the communities, and that those might not always be full polling places that are open constantly, like Senator Mitchell was was addressing, um, that there are needs that are, the people who are running our elections might see are being unmet. And this gives them the flexibility within their role, which they are already fulfilling, to ensure that there are enough early voting locations, that there are enough to meet the needs, that they have the flexibility to do that. Um, so. I would be against taking this part out. I do think that there is opportunity here to continue to have the conversation, um, to make sure that this is written in the way that you know addresses the the concerns that Senator Coran raised. Um, but I I think this is already written to be within the purview of the people who are already setting up these early voting sites. Thank you, Senator Port. Um, I think we'll, we will take uh, take Mr. Chairman, roll. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, Senator Lemmer. I could make a comment. Uh, Senator Westland talked about proper notice of where these places might be, but that isn't the direction my question was. My question is, who chooses those locations? And uh, an auditor may be one that's hired to to do some of the election responsibilities, but There's enough suspicion about improper election process in this state that's been around for many years. This gives an opportunity to continue that debate and raise more and more questions of where a roving, rolling polling place is. And quite honestly, I think it can be abused significantly. So um, I will always question the integrity of the election system in Minnesota regardless of who the political party is in, in charge at any time. Well, so. Senator Limmer, I think we've had a lot of questioning of the election system here, and most of it has been misinformation with an intention to misinform the public. But Senator Westland. Mr. Chair, just as a, the folks who, the county auditor, the municipal clerk, the people who administer our elections, actually, they take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And they are the ones who are designating the early voting locations. They have to provide notice of where those locations are going to, to be. They have to notify the Secretary of State's office 46 days before the early voting period. And they have to publish their designated locations at least 14 days before the first day of early voting. So if somebody had an issue or a problem with a location, they certainly will have notice, um, and they would bring that, I would imagine, to the county auditor or the municipal clerk. But I would like to say that the people who are administering our elections are under attack on a very regular basis. And these are folks who, uh, again, have sworn to uphold the Constitution. They are doing the very best job that they can. and and. I don't approach our elections officials with suspicion. And I have not seen anything, any evidence, to show that there has been any sort of widespread reason to, sus to suspect the folks who are merely trying to administer our elections to the best that they can, supported by volunteers from the community who are administering that election. So. I, I oppose the, the amendment, and I'm just asking members to vote no. Thank you, Senator, Senator Westland. The clerk will take the roll. Senator Carlson. No. Senator Westland. No. Senator Coran. Yes. Senator Anderson. Yes. Senator Barr. Aye. Senator Bolden. No. Senator Swadzinski. No. Senator Dornick. Yes. Senator Limmer. Yes. Senator Marty. Senator Matthews? Yes. Senator Mitchell? No. Senator Port? No. Senator Rust?
There being six yeses and eight noes, the motion is not adopted. Mr. Chair. Senator Just Grant. Just my, uh, uh, my last comment, so thank you. Uh, Senator, Senator Westland, um, I think, you know, your statements about the trust, really tr what, what I want is transparency, trust, and notifications and those locations of locations, if they're necessary, somebody didn't just decide a month before to say this is a great location. I know great forethought goes into it, and so we can plan as efficiently, or we can plan to accommodate great and early notice, not 14 days before the beginning of election period. Because we live in a period of time when we have more methods to communicate, effect, more methods to communicate than ever in the history of mankind, but fewer methods to communicate effectively than ever in the history of mankind. And so when you say we meet minimum requirements, the county's got to post it on a site. No one cares because very few people go to a county site, right, and to try and locate those things. We need them broadly published as early as possible when they, when they start to think about elections as soon as possible. So I, I would love to work with you on that and find a, find a period of notification that we can agree upon. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cran. We are going to lay this yeah. bill over so uh, it gives you an opportunity to, to uh, work with the author on it. So. And Mr. Chair, I would just say I, I, these are important things that we're doing. They're important bills. Um, I would love to work with folks. It's just hard from my perspective, per, perhaps as a freshman legislature, le legislator, um, to, to do things kind of on the flying committee. And um, I would love to work across the aisle with members to try to make s these bills um, so that they have appeal to everyone so that we can get broad support. Mr. Chairman. Senator. Senator Limmer. Uh, before we lay the bill on the table, um, I had just gotten a note from the city of Maple Grove, uh, where 70% of my voters uh, reside. The city of Maple Grove sent this note saying, we want to convey our significant concerns with the voting hour requirements in this bill. We struggle to staff elections under current hours of service for the period of absentee balloting. This requirement would be crippling to cities across Minnesota, and if we were even able to hire the staff needed, dramatically increase the cost of administering an election to each city. And they make specific reference to voting hour requirements noted in section 12, line 6.23. This was a letter uh, or an email sent to both me, uh, Senator Westland, and, and other area legislators. Uh, expressing their concern about progressing this bill. Just wanted to make sure that was in the record. Yes, Senator Limmer, we did hear some concern about dates as well from, uh, uh, from Ms. Erickson also. So I think uh, you know, uh, Senator Westland is going to work with uh, right. people to figure that out. So yep. we appreciate that. And we'd, we'd also appreciate that, you know, the, if, if this came from someone who is involved in it, overseeing elections to, and one of the things I guess I must say is that we, we need to be sure that we treat our election officials with as much respect as possible because that's a problem that we have in getting, getting people to work, for, uh, work on elections is uh, uh, making sure that we maintain respect for them. So uh, Mr. Think, Chair, just briefly, if I could just respond very briefly, and, and Senator Limmer, thank you for raising that. I know Ms. Erickson raised a concern. I think the Secretary of State, had, everyone has a different time frame, and I think the intention was to try to have uniformity um, across the state so that voters would have some sort of consistency, and there is always a tension between wanting to have that consistency while at the same time having local control. And again, we will continue to work on this. We would like people to be as happy with this as possible, understanding that it is probably going to be unlikely um, that everyone will be completely happy with it. But we are working with um, the cities and the counties and we'll continue to do so. So I thank you for bringing uh, that, that uh, information forward. We have a question from Senator Matthews. We're, in, we're holding up the uh, taking of the roll until we get just a couple more questions answered here. Yeah. Uh, Senator Rest. Well, I, I just want to um, uh, reiterate um, Senator Limmer's uh, concern from Maple Grove. I received a um, equally distressed um, uh, email from the city clerk of uh, uh, New Hope mm -hmm. uh, about about that those very um, provisions. So Senator Westland, um, uh, 
uh, I would say something needs to give here. Mr. Chair. And Senator Rust, I, yes. I, I think again, Senator I have Wexler. said very clearly that we understand we have continued to get feedback. It is a, we will continue to work on this after we lay it over and we will continue to hear from all of the stakeholders to make sure that we come up with something that is going to be workable. Thank you. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Westland, wondering if you could clarify uh, something, make sure I understood correctly. Um, currently, like how the last election and, and several uh, previous to that, uh, the early voting window where you submit an absentee ballot and you can do it in person, uh, was that it, like in my uh, area, and I'm, I'm somewhat rural, Minnesota, um, is that the county government center in each particular county, and then election day was every township, every city precinct, uh, those locations open on election day. So under your proposal with the new 18-day early voting period, uh, is, that, is that a requirement to open up for 18 days in every one of those precinct and township locations, or will it be the same county government spot only, and instead of an absentee ballot, it's now the regular early voting ballot on that 18th day? And I guess that could be to either of the two testifiers that want to answer that. <laughs> who's, who's finding for that? <laughs> Ms. <laughs> Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Matthews. Um, uh, what the, the bill requires uh, any county office to administer um, this early voting, as well as any cities who are authorized to administer absentee voting. Um, so if your city City Hall didn't already administer absentee voting during the absentee voting period, they would not be required. Um, okay. Follow up, Senator Matthews. Um, no, I think, uh, I think the rest will be best taken behind the scenes. Thank you. Thank you. This, uh, this bill is being laid over, and with uh, that as our uh, final business, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>